Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, Labor unveils its latest plans for the NT intervention. Journos and politicians rated untrustworthy in shock poll. And how to end the farce of question time. A retiring Liberal MP puts forward his ideas. Our panel tonight, Imre Salazinski from The Australian, New South Wales Minister for Family and Community Services, Prue Goward, and David Hetherington from the think tank Per Capita. Well, the Prime Minister has launched a discussion paper on the future of the Northern Territory intervention, focusing on school attendance, alcohol restrictions and jobs. The paper, called Stronger Futures, comes a day after the fourth anniversary of the intervention, which was started by the Howard government. The five-year compulsory leases over remote communities, Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, imposed by the intervention, expire in August next year. The PM says this time round, consulting with Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is critical. We know that this was started without uh, consultation with Aboriginal people and we know that starting it without that consultation did lead to feelings of hurt and feelings of shame. Uh, I saw that myself in the Northern Territory when I met with uh, Aboriginal leaders with tears in their eyes. Indigenous Minister Jenny Macklin says she wants to hear from people whose voices aren't normally heard. I want those people who normally do not have a voice to have a voice in these conversations. For those people who are the subject of domestic violence, for those children who uh, are the subject of alcohol abuse, for their parents uh, to be able to talk to me freely. David, these talks are due to start next week. They're due to go for six weeks. Is, is consulting the right move? I think absolutely it is. I think um, uh, Julie Gillard made the point in her press conference today that she felt there hadn't been a consultation in the original constitution of the intervention under the Howard government. Um, but equally importantly, there hasn't been a lot of con consultation as the Labor government has introduced major policy proposals like the minerals, resource, rent tax and others. So I think it's really important that um, there is buy-in from the Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and it's important that what the government's done today is, is um, flag a set of priorities and then open them up for discussion rather than lay a fait accompli on the table. Prune, was it a mistake in the first place not to consult with these communities? Well, a consultation, particularly with Indigenous communities, is obviously always important. But remember, the original intervention was the result of a very critical and alarming report about the circumstances facing Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory. And because of the, the cr crisis that that report presented, I understand the government had to act quickly. I mean, you can consult, but at the end of the day, the government's responsible for every child death and every child that doesn't grow up to meet its full potential, and that's what they had to get on with. Though that report, and we'll talk to Rex Wild, the co-author yes. of that report, a bit later in the show, that report did say... There needs to be consultation. You sure. need to do it through the community. Yes, but when you have the sort of alarming figures that were presented in that report, I don't think John Howard had any choice. And I note that uh, that was four years ago. There's been several uh, opportunities since then, if this government really had wanted to, to go back and consult on a lot of the detail, because this has been an unfolding story. Uh, there are a lot of opportunity to consult, and they didn't either. And I suspect for the same reason you had to get start getting some results. And the results are obviously occurring and I think there's some very valuable lessons for we the states and territories about how we intervene in our inter uh, disadvantaged communities, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. And Imre, even though Julie Gillard is now saying it was a mistake not to consult, she did support, well, the government of the day did, sorry, the Labor opposition of the day did support the Howard government in intervening in the Northern Territory. Exactly and you know the issue seems to be so divisive, I'm not sure whether talking you know, to the end of the, the century will bring everyone on, on, on board. It seems to be the case that those closest to the areas of crisis Pru mentioned within our Indigenous communities themselves are the ones most open to the emergency powers and the further away you get from it, the more people are concerned about the, the way, for example, that it, it breaches the Racial mm. Discrimination Act and so on. But, uh, you know, to take up what Prue was saying, we had a very disturbing report here in New South Wales um, 10 days ago by the Auditor General, really showing that most of the programs that our State Aboriginal Affairs Department is delivering by the older protocols, lots of consultation, complete recognition of, you know, the Racial Discrimination Act and so on, had done more harm than good. So I thought, 
you know, it, it's yet more confirmation that a different way of doing business is really justified. Prue, you're responsible for protecting children in New South Wales as the Minister for Community Services. Mm. What, what works in, in protecting children? Because that was the nub of the report, the Little Children's Sacred Report. It was about protecting Aboriginal ch children yep. in remote communities from abuse. And giving them a future as well. Obviously, uh, alcohol management and drug addiction in parents is a terrible problem for a child. It, it just limits them and uh, exposes them to uh, abuse and neglect, uh, as does lack of opportunity to attend school, parents that aren't uh, supportive of a child going to school or indeed um, reading to them at home or any of those things. So I think uh, there are a number, and mental health and mental illness in parents is is a very big problem for children. Again, it's a, it's a great indicator of of the chances of that child being neglected or abused, as of course is domestic violence. Now, there, there are lots of lessons out of the intervention. Some things you would do and some things you'd do different in some things you wouldn't do. I think one of the most interesting ones is income maintenance, which was very controversial. Uh, and it goes to, as Imre says, this, this um, ideological contest, but also an ethical contest between do you get in there and just ensure that children have access to the resources they need, like food and clothing and a house to live in, and if that means making people spend their money in a certain way, that's fine. Or do you say the right of everybody to spend their money as they see fit and to bring their children up as they see fit is paramount and the state has no say in it? That's the ethical dilemma that the intervention deals and the, with. And there's divisions within those communities about and, that. And may I say, it is foolish, I think, to just keep seeing this as an, an Indigenous problem and a race problem. The pilot programs that we are now seeing in the States, funded by the Commonwealth, and there's one in New South Wales at Blacktown, is not about uh, income management for an Indigenous community. It's income management in a community where there are generations of disadvantage. And, and there's the same issues of cycles of welfare uh, dependency. Exactly and the same. And domestic violence and uh, lack of exposure to education and its value. Kids that don't go to school hardly turn up at school. Uh, drug and alcohol addiction in parents and mental illness in parents. Exactly the same issues. Disadvantage has no colour. David, what about the issue of jobs? And that's something that Jenny Macklin and Julia Gillard stressed today. It's really hard to create employment in remote Indigenous communities. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the basic economic infrastructure is, is weak or, or absent um, from uh, education and skills right through to the kind of end demand that you need to sustain uh, these jobs. So there's an enormous capacity building effort that needs to, needs to unfold. Um, and some of the signs of progress that they note in the report today, the creation of of um, 2,000 jobs kind of across the, across the um, intervention areas, while promising, um, still gives you a, a sense of the scale of what's, what's still to do. And uh, I, I note that uh, an, a degree of the report is actually responding to close the gap initiatives and it, it alludes right at the beginning to you know, the 17-year life expectancy gap that's still there. And that's an enormous gap to close. And I think We've got to be careful to manage expectations and this is going to be a long, slow process and, and we've got to take on board those, those elements that work. I think income management has proven itself to work in certain circumstances. You see the take-up of voluntary income management now, which I think is a heartening step. Mm. Um, but there's a long way to go and I think you know, recognition of the complex factors and, and the length of the journey is really important. Emory? Well, I think it's significant reading through this discussion paper that there's absolutely no evidence I see in it that this government intends to take its foot off the pedal as far as the emergency response goes. So uh, I, I think the thing has achieved a good degree of bipartisanship and that's highly significant. OK, moving on to other issues. Sorry, Prue, final comment? Yes, I'd just like to make give an example of yep. where we get ourselves caught up when we worry about the choices people make and the freedom to make choices. Uh, one of the major causes of uh, people moving out of public housing and becoming homeless and then that peripatetic lifestyle that comes with that is that they don't pay their rent. And we are not allowed, as state governments, to require the federal government to apportion part of somebody on uh, Centrelink payments uh, that rent in advance so that it is paid every week so that the person doesn't become homeless. So for all the right reasons, we said people should be allowed to manage their own money, but people with mental illness or with addictions and the sorts of reasons why many people, not all, but many people are in public housing, means that they find that very difficult to do. And yet we can't save them from homelessness. In fact, we've made it worse by being generous ethically about this ethical issue of people having the right to choose.
Liberal Senator Alan Ferguson has used his final speech to the Senate to call for reform of question time. If it was up to me, I would abolish question time as it is currently structured. Yeah. It is a total waste of time. A total waste of time. And dare I say it, not much better in the other place, if not worse. We are, we have in, a, in the Australian Parliament the worst question time of any other parliament that uses the Westminster system throughout the world. Senator Ferguson went on to say that the way to improve question time was for all questions to be placed on notice and to allow anyone in the chamber to be allowed to ask a supplementary question. Prue, what are your thoughts on what Senator Ferguson said then? Well, you know, he's retiring and he's put up with it for 19 years and now he's decided he didn't like it after all. Uh, but I think it's a great test of character, question time. It, it tests both a government and the members of the government's understanding of the, of the issues that they're facing with. Tests the character of the people watching it too, uh, correct? Yes, sometimes it does that. And it also tests the character of an opposition. I mean, our opposition, for example, this week has pursued what I'd call a whole lot of irrelevant issues. I have not been asked a question about child protection since we've been in government. And yet they would have said that was one of their key interests. But no, uh, they stick on the irrelevancy. So, but, uh, so I think that um, it's very easy to uh, criticise question time, but it is a test of character and of intention and of the nature of government. But could we do it better? Alan Ferguson is saying, you know, he went well, to the... Well, you don't U abolish it. OK, he says abolish it as it stands now and replace it with something I think he's virtually saying more like the UK system. And he points out that when he went to the House of Lords... Sorry, not the House of Lords, the House of Commons in yes. the UK, that David Cameron asked, answered 25 questions within half an hour and they'd been put on notice. So there was an accountability issue there where these questions were put up and you got decent answers to them. But the Prime Minister of Great Britain is only in the question in the